we all have issues, and I don't care or need to hear about yours. That's a pretty harsh statement, isn't it? See, that's what somebody told me at a very young age, and it would haunt me for years to come. See, I've always had trouble talking about how I felt. I think it's something that a lot of Hispanics, especially males, deal with. We're kind of expected to just push away our emotions and man up. But I was a pretty shy and emotional kid, and just pushing away my emotions wasn't easy for me. From first to third grade, I barely had any friends except for my cousin, Michael, in the grade above. And because I was the shy, emotional kid, I ended up getting bullied and beat up a lot. I remember in the second grade, I was sitting, waiting to get picked up by my parents, when this older guy, maybe sixth grade, came and started attacking me. I had no idea what to do. I was just there getting punched over and over again. And I didn't know what to do. Eventually, a teacher did come by and stop the kid. But when the teacher was asking me what had happened, I was just completely silent. We all have issues, and I don't care, I need to hear about yours, kept ringing over and over again. Fourth grade was a year when a lot changed, though. I was put into the advanced work class and made friends with my fellow nerds. <laughs> I also uh, met this woman who I only ever knew as Coach Dawn. She was everything I aspired to be and more. She was funny. She made friends easily. She knew how to light up the room with her presence. Every, every Friday at recess, she would play music, and everybody would just dance. It sounds dumb, but there I learned how to express myself and not care what people thought about me. I remember she taught me and my friends how to dance the Gundam style, and it's one of my happiest memories. When I graduated fifth grade, I couldn't wait to come back and visit Coach Don. So then one day, I was doing what a lot of people do. I was Googling my friends to see if I could find funny pictures of them. I looked up Jason, I looked up Varez, and I even looked up my fifth grade teacher, Ms. Clark Mason. But when I Googled Coach Don, funny pictures didn't show up. What showed up was an article saying that she had been shot and killed. I wasn't sure what to do. I didn't know how to react. I just fell and cried. I had no way to cope, and I had no way to tell my family. How do you explain the impact that someone has on you at such a young age? Unfortunately, life wasn't done throwing curved balls my way. See, I'm a first-generation American, and with that comes a lot of challenges. One being that you don't really see parts of your family a lot, if not ever. I've only ever met my grandpa once, and it was because he was dying. I'd never met him, and my parents wanted to make sure that I'd at least see him once. It was only for a couple of days, but I was so glad that I got to meet him. But then not long after, he died, and I was devastated. I remember being told that one of my cousins had cancer and that she would die. I was heartbroken. I was devastated. And I was confused because I didn't even know what cancer was yet. When Coach Don passed, I dealt with it by not dealing with it. And that's how I was dealing with everything else that was happening to me. That led to a lot of bottled up emotions and led a lot of self-hate. I would look in the mirror, point out every single little imperfection about myself, and I would tell myself I'm worthless. I would have panic attacks, and I would hide them in fear of being told that I have a problem. Then one day, I had a panic attack, and my mom and my sister saw me. They helped calm me down, but they wanted to bring me to the doctor. When I got to the doctor, he told me I might have depression and recommended a therapist. I got really angry at that and took it as an insult. To me, if I went to a therapist, it was like I was giving up. It was, it was like I was admitting that I had a problem. Things did get better, though. It was with a little bit of dumb luck. Uh, at the end of my sophomore year, my parents wanted me to get a job for the summer. And my sister suggested that I work at Stepping Stone, which is an organization that um, helps underserved children get educational opportunities. And I applied to be a teaching assistant, and surprisingly, I got the job. I was a little nervous because I didn't know how I would be with kids. But as soon as I walked through the door on that first day, I knew that I'd become a part of something bigger than myself. I was being a friend and a mentor to kids who were just like me, kids with a lot of potential, but just needed a little guidance. 
There was one scholar in particular that I really connected with. Her name was Liliana. <laughs> At first, she was this shy little kid, but as I got to know her, she had a lot to say. She, <laughs> there were so many similarities to us. She talked like me, she joked like me, she even laughed a little like me. We had all these little inside jokes. I taught her how to do a hand hug, which is like this, and it became like our exclusive handshake. Uh, now, like whenever someone asks me for a hand hug, I have to be like, oops, I can't. <laughs> whenever something funny or awkward would happen in class, we would just look at each other and laugh. And, but because we're so similar, I also noticed how sometimes we're similar in how we doubt ourselves. Sometimes she didn't realize how amazing she actually is. I remember one time uh, she had to do a lab write-up after we did a lab in science class. And she got really frustrated and said she was dumb. I was shocked by this because that's exactly something I would have done a few months prior. And a flashback came to me of me telling myself I was worthless. And I told myself I wouldn't let that happen to Liliana. In those moments, I always wanted someone to come to me and just help. So that's what I did. And over it said, hey, let's try this out. And I joked around with her. And I acted like I was doing a lot to help, but really, she was doing all the work. Eventually, she got it back, and she got a check plus plus on it, which is like really good. <laughs> and she would come up to me and be like, Mr. Jimenez, it was all because of you. But really, it was all because of her. The reason this was all so impactful to me, it was because I was being the mentor that I needed for these kids. I was being my own coach, Don. It, it impacted me in ways I didn't know possible. I was genuinely smiling again. I was doing random things like running for fun, even though I was so out of shape. <laughs> but it's important for me to point out that just because I'm a lot better now, it doesn't mean that I'm completely healed. Stuff like that just doesn't go away in a flash. Some days I just need to be silent all by myself, and that's okay. The difference between the rough days now and the rough days a year ago is that I know I can and will be happy. At the end of the summer, Liliana gave me this bracelet right here, and I haven't taken it off since I got it. It represents everything to me, and it reminds me of the kids, and it reminds me of my importance, not just to myself, but to them. And whenever, not, whenever I'm having a rough day or a rough time, I just hold it to my heart, and it gives me like new energy. Now, what's the point of all this? I just told you so many things that parts of my family don't even know. See, the thing is, when it comes to mental health, there's no one-size-fits-all way of dealing with it. All my life, I was told, just talk about it more, just talk about it more. And at that point in my life, it just wasn't something I was ready to do. What I found is that being there for the scholars and helping them was my own form of self-help. We all have issues, and I'm starting to care about mine more. Thank you. <laughs>